John, I always enjoy taking the chance at Mobile World Congress to catch up with you on Qualcomm's advanced R&D priorities. So uh, I want to start by really understanding your philosophy. You work on such a long runway, so it'd be great to hear about how you kind of balance what's practical and what's possible, particularly as we think about 5G advanced as a maybe evolutionary step ahead of 6G, which would maybe be a bit more revolutionary. So how do you, how do you keep that balance intact? Yeah, the balance really is about trying to do the right things at the right scale. So we have to make a variety of bets, if you will. There's, there's the longer moonshots when we're trying to make the impossible possible, kind of bring that technology forward in time. It's also about really working with our business teams to understand what's the highest value from a prioritization standpoint that can move the needle for something like IoT or XR or automotive connectivity. And so we often then looking at philosophically that combining of long-term research but really feeding ourselves on a lot of interesting intermediate term topics and within those identifying the bigger kind of complex ideas that can take us forward into a longer term research strategy. You know, and one of these uh, ideas that I wanted to get some insight in is this kind of transition from massive MIMO onto giga MIMO as we start to understand the role that the upper mid band will play in 5G advanced and 6G. So where are you, where are you looking today? Yeah, what we're always looking to is how do we get the most value out of the current infrastructure investments. If we look at how can we bring more connectivity to more people as cost effectively as possible. So as you're saying, it's about that new spectrum band. So even some of the discussions in WRC 23, some of the discussions on bands say above six, seven gigahertz, how can we make those feasible for cellular? So we did some interesting research, for example, at 13 gigahertz, we said, how can I take the sort of massive MIMO technology we helped evolve and design and standardize and implement as part of 5G and say, can we actually take that to the next step, even more antenna elements, but still keeping that same physical form factor so it can reuse the same cell sites and get that same range. So, so bringing that extended coverage, but at these higher frequency bands. So a combination of capacity and coverage that could be brought into tomorrow's macro cell network. Okay. And then REDCap. I think when you and I first started talking about REDCap, the um, immediate focus was around lightweight wearables and IoT type devices. And I, I do want to get some perspective from you on REDCap as an enabler of massive IoT. But we've seen this kind of interesting thing pop up where REDCap platforms going into CPEs to support fixed wireless access with uh, you know, markets that might not have the, the need for those gigabit type speeds to the home. So what's the outlook for REDCap on FWA, but then more broadly on massive IoT? Yeah, we're really excited about how REDCap ecosystem continues to evolve. So we did indeed have that perspective. We can bring say 100, 200 megabit per second data rates into a, a more cost effective, lower price module and chipset. And the SDX35 was that product we announced last year. What's exciting now, indeed, it's making its way into other types of EMBB use cases. I, I, when we're looking at bridging the digital divide in more economies, more markets, it's really hitting a really interesting value play to bring connectivity to more people. And a couple hundred megabits per second is a great data rate for many types of applications. So whether it's connecting a laptop, whether it's connecting fixed wireless, whether it's bringing in new types of use cases that might not have been on cellular into a more cost-effective cellular. And as you say, at the same time, the IoT ecosystem's always evolving. The use cases, the monetization, the way operators are looking at, hey, I can bring that into my system. It's not gonna use up a lot of capacity, but it really is gonna open up new service possibilities. And so that's where we're seeing that, that IoT and that expansion into things like logistics and tracking and just more types of connected devices, making use of that SDX35 based, more cost effective product line. And then we've got to talk about AI. I've been around the stand out there and uh, the focus now seems to be on on-device generative AI. You've got some really compelling examples of what that can open up in terms of applications, but there's a continuum, right? It's the device, it's the edge, it's the cloud. We're seeing a lot of fundamental transitions in the way networks are architected and managed. So in, in some ways, you know, the, the RAN is almost a feature of the cloud. So help me understand what all this means over the long term. Yeah, AI is one of those great examples of a technology that's right adjacent to wireless. Same way cloud is right adjacent. So those are huge ecosystems in and of itself. 
So as we're designing that next generation of wireless, as we're evolving 5G and Wi-Fi, it's about recognizing that we can have compute power that's much larger than before, and we can harness it in different ways, whether it's a large language model or other advanced AI techniques. So indeed, it is a continuum. We have the device, much more powerful on-device AI. For example, the HN3 platform bringing huge capabilities to the device. And then we recognize there's new types of IoT devices that will also have that compute right in the device. And then you bring in a more intelligent network, more intelligent edge cloud. And then you realize that the air interface itself, the communication between the device and the network, that's also going to get more intelligent. So we can bring AI natively, for example, into the 6G standard. We're studying a lot of that as part of release 18 and now into release 19 and 3GBP. And it's also saying, how would I change the air interface to be more efficient? How can I better do job at predicting things, at, at decreasing the amount of overhead for information exchange between the device and the network? So it's a pretty exciting area of research for us because we're combining not only Qualcomm's amazing hardware capabilities and software capabilities, but then looking at the air interface wireless innovation, saying I can bring these together in very interesting ways, and you have those new connected distributed compute experiences. We can even bring connectivity and compute in different ways from smart XR glasses to a smartphone to the edge of the network to the cloud and even move that processing around based on instantaneous performance. So it's a really exciting area and a great example of a technology vector that's just moving really, really quickly. And you know, with 6G, it's, it's 2024. It somehow at the same time feels very pressing but very far away. But I know you and your team are really deep in here. So maybe lay out the vision of 6G for us and help us understand how you get from where we are today to that kind of future vision. Yeah, so here we are today in 2024. And we're looking at the sort of 6G technologies that are going to make a difference if they're deployed six years from now in 2030 but more importantly, that they're going to make sense and add value to a network and to types of devices from 2030 all the way to 2040. So those vectors of 5G, 6G improvement, we're looking at how do we design a more AI native air interface? How do we bring in new frequency bands? And more importantly, also, how do we enable more cost-effective, energy-efficient designs into a refreshed cellular infrastructure? So how can we have that improvements even in legacy FDD bands? In TDD bands that are already in use today, we can have that 6G designs bringing in huge amounts of cost effectively and then also serving more immersive applications. So with 2024, we're continuing to see a lot of interesting, particularly here at MWC, applications of XR and wireless. As we look at a more immersive communications environment, 6G is also going to bring in sensing, RF sensing, understanding the physical environment and bringing in that AI component. So indeed, it's about looking at future use cases, the energy and cost effectively, effectiveness of operating the network, and then also the reality that there's more and more connected devices. So for us, our 6G design right now is about making sure we're hitting each of those key target areas to have that maximum impact. Well, John, I think you all are having a tremendous uh, impact today, and based on the wireless research that you conduct with your colleagues day in, day out, it's going to be a really interesting future. So thank you for sharing that vision with us. Yeah, thanks very much. Mm -hmm.